Shana Tova. The holiday and season that we begin tonight are admittedly a little bit confusing. Simultaneously, we celebrate and atone. We reflect and we prepare. We pray as individuals and as a community. We restart the never-ending cycle of the year and we hope to break our patterns. Our patterns. We hope to break our patterns. No? <laughs> we hope to break our patterns <laughs> of behavior. Our liturgy tells us that we have authority over our future and to submit to God's ultimate judgment. The high holiday season is one that is steeped in duality. And to explain the themes and meanings of the days of awe is to make sense of contradictions, to hold in both hands paradoxical truths. To live in this duality is perhaps one of the most difficult things our tradition calls us to do. And in all honesty, it is easier, it's more efficient, and it's more comforting to have only one truth. Every other day of the year, we pursue an ultimate truth and see the world around us according to that lens. It helps us categorize our experiences and our relationships. Things either are or they aren't. They're good or they're not. They're right or they're not. They're in or they're out, and there's no in-between. And logically, we know that we can't live our lives only ever seeing one truth. Yet every natural and healthy instinct in our bodies tells us to sort and to classify. From the beginning of time, we've sorted ourselves into tribes, animals and plants into species, and land into territories. We do this for safety and for well-being, for ourselves as well as for those around us. From the earliest days of our evolution, classification and tribalism has helped us to survive and to thrive. Predators, poisons, potential threats were neutralized or even entirely avoided thanks to our subconscious responses. We've built communities, societies, and made previously unimaginable progress through our ability to know what and who goes together. We have separated ourselves from the rest of the animal kingdom through our nature and by nurturing our instincts into deliberate behaviors. History and our human nature have shown time and time again how important this impulse is. But it doesn't take an evolutionary biologist to see that something has changed with the arrival of modernity. Today, we label and segregate not simply for our physical safety, but for our emotional and ideological well-being. Though the daily lives of our humanity are drastically different from our time as hunters and gatherers, we still rely on many of the same rules and techniques. Trust, cooperation, and innovation are key to every variety of human community and too often they feel in short supply. We want to trust, but we are wary of being manipulated. We want to cooperate, but we fear being taken advantage of. We want to innovate, but feel such anxiety that maintaining the status quo becomes our default. We've learned that to expect these qualities of everyone is to invite disappointment and failure. And so we've learned only to count on a select few. People who look like us, people who think like us and speak like us, people who live like us and in the same places as us, they are the only ones we can reliably have confidence in. Our modern day tribes echo our ancient ones, replacing communal protection against dangerous predators with group preservation 
against the worldviews and ideologies that seek to poison our prosperity. He's so wrong, I can't even talk to him. I can't watch that news channel, it only makes me angry. Every conversation with her just ends in a fight. It's not worth it. Statements like these are all too common today and show our continued reliance on our tribes. We've developed a deep unwillingness to seek out or engage with the challenges of other people. We stick to our corners of the world for intellectual and emotional self-preservation and only rarely do we leave our protective havens. We do so only when we're convinced that we are correct and use those convictions as weapons against the ideological war that greets us the moment we open the door or post on Facebook. And this too is a part of our Jewish tradition. Commandments and origin stories are not the only thing we have received through our reading of Torah. Again and again, we hear of the 12 tribes of Israel confronting neighboring kingdoms and peoples and even other Israelite tribes as they travel through the wilderness. Again and again, we hear how these encounters end in bloodshed, in winners and losers, in the loss of life and property, in the reaffirmation of conflict and difference. Tribalism in any era is not simply something that other people do, but not us. Tribalism is not just an external threat to our Jewish existence. Tribalism is at our Jewish core too. And perhaps this difficult truth is no better exemplified than, that, than by the progenitor of our people and the cent central character of our Rosh Hashanah Torah reading. Tomorrow morning, we will listen to the story of Abraham hearing the call of God, instructing him to take his son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah and offer him up as a sacrifice. Abraham is so fervent in his belief that he's willing not only to martyr his son, but to slaughter him with his own hand. Abraham is willing to risk his future and ours because he is so deeply prepared to do what is easy, what is less risky, and most basic, that he never even seems to think about the dangers associated with these instincts. As we gather tonight to welcome a new year and new possibilities, we must ask ourselves if this is really the legacy that we wish to, per to perpetuate. How did we, how did our tradition, how did Abraham get to this moment? Is this truly who we are? And I know my answer. I say, no, of course not. We are so much more than, a, than inheritors of Abraham's moment on the mountain and the Israelites' wars in the wilderness. We are inheritors of a much greater promise, a promise that is equally a part of our history as our need to identify and to classify. The promise received when God told Abraham, Lech Lecha. Go, Abraham, he, God told him. Head out from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, a nation worthy of my blessing. The first conversation recorded be between God and Abraham was a command to leave leave his family and his home, leave everything that brought him comfort and safety in order to fulfill God's vision and receive God's blessing. Abraham's promise, and thereby ours, is to leave everything that he knew and everyone that would protect him in search of something greater, in search of the possibility that comes with encountering something different. How often we restrict ourselves not only to a corner of the world, but to a corner of the room because it's safe and it's comfortable. How often we miss out on the blessing we receive every time we meet and converse with someone from a different faith, 
a different ethnicity, different background, or a different political stance. How much more blessing we would find when we hear our own lech lecha moments and respect not only the command, but who we find the journey, along the journey as well. Part of the promise that began our entire Jewish story is one that tells us that not every experience in the wilderness needs to be a clash of fists, swords, or ideologies. The promise given to Abraham by God and inherited by us is a promise that leaving our tribe to meet others makes us better. This is a promise we must uphold. And in considering Abraham's legacy, I can't help but be reminded of the times when the instinctual divisions between them and us have been made ever so clear. In the aftermath of terrorism, our nation becomes gripped in a complete and unending fear from every horrific act of extreme tribalism. We all become so scared, so confused, so worried about all the unforeseen tragedies coming our way. Each one has made us retreat deeper and deeper into our safe havens of familiarity. And I remember one place that had a different response. In 2001, one of my favorite TV shows, The West Wing, was about to enter its third season. They were supposed to continue a storyline about a president and his staff dealing with the daily trials and tribulations of government. Instead, the cast and crew quickly produced a new season premiere, airing only three weeks after 9-11 and responding to what felt like a new world order. In this episode, a group of high school students are visiting the White House which suddenly has to lock down. The students are taken to the mess hall to wait until the Secret Service gives the all clear. As they wait, the White House senior staff comes by and they discuss extremism and terrorism. They discuss gangs and, they, and spies. They speak with the First Lady about the beginning of tribalism in the Bible when Ishmael and Hagar were exiled from their home with Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. And eventually, the president enters the room and one student asks if there isn't something brave in dying for one's own beliefs, something noble in becoming a martyr. The president takes a second and re eventually replies, we don't need martyrs now, we need heroes. A hero would die for his country, but he would much rather live for it. When Abraham heard God's call and chose to live according to that promise, he became a hero. When he threw aside the knife and Isaac's martyrdom, he became a hero. He knew that there would be adversity on the road ahead of him, that he would encounter enemies and threats that he might never again find the safety and security assured him in his homeland and in his father's house. But he left anyway. He chose to live for a possibility of greatness and a potential to find a new blessing in every encounter that lay ahead of him. We are inheritors of Abraham's promise and his heroism. We too, are called to go out and find, to go out and discuss, to go out and learn about everything that's different and become better by that experience. We need more heroes in the world. We need more people willing to walk across the room and engage in meaningful dialogue. We need to be willing to cast aside the knives of tribal policies and practices that threaten to cut us off from our neighbors. We need to remember how to break the impenetrable barriers that have previously promised safety and head instead for the blessing of the unknown journey. We need to make that promise to each other. 
we need to become the heroes. There's a story told of a traveling merchant who happened upon a town with which he wanted to do business. He approached the entrance and marveled at the surrounding walls which had stood for a hundred generations, protecting its occupants. He entered, completed his trades, and enjoyed the town's hospitality so much that he decided to stay for a few extra days. That Friday, as he began, as the sun began to set and the lamps lit up the streets, he watched with curiosity as each person walked to the town square, preparing to welcome Shabbat and singing. Hey, oh, oh. Shabbat passed, and eventually it was time for the merchant to continue his journey. Months later, the merchant came back down the same road and encountered another walled town. He entered, completed his trades, and noticed that Shabbat was, again, about to begin. As the sun began to set, he watched as people left their homes, welcoming Shabbat and singing. How could this be, he wondered. Two different towns with such a similar practice. I know the songs are different, but something here reminds me of the other. Desperate to figure it out, the merchant remained in the second town, asking everyone if they've ever heard of the first. No one knew the other town even existed, and certainly never heard of the other song. A week passed, and the merchant eventually sensed that the townspeople were getting a little frustrated with his questions. His next stop was not too far away, and Shabbat was about to begin. The merchant said his goodbyes, left town, and hurried along the road. But it quickly became obvious he would not reach the next town before sunset. He decided to set up camp on the side of the road and watch as the sky shifted to night. As he lay alone, watching the stars appear one by one, he heard the goings-on, in the towns ahead and behind. The merchant lay there listening to the songs meet each other and creating the most beautiful harmonies he'd ever heard. He realized that the only thing stopping each town from hearing the other were the walls closing them off. As they understandably closed their gates against predators and external threats, they also closed their potential to hear the music of others and sing their respective songs together. He spent the next week running between the two towns, calling to anyone who would listen to start Shabbat, not in the town square, but at the open gates. The sun set, the lamps guided only the bravest townspeople to a place they'd never thought they'd be. Only then, standing at the edge of their familiar town and the unfamiliar wilderness, did they hear another song and realize what they'd been missing. From then on, they understood, it's safer to sing alone to never jeopardize one's own song by seeking out something different. But songs sound better when we hear others too. The truest test of heroism happens when we leave comfort and security for potential and blessing. Heroes are heard and heroes listen. 
Heroes are willing to heed the call and journey through the risky unknown. We've always been heroes, even if we might have forgotten how. This year, let us promise, let us promise each other to remember how to be that hero and make 5780 a year of blessing. Shana Tova. Oh, yeah. 